You know, I hate the Packers. I really, really hate those stupid cheeseheads. Who they are, their fan base, what they represent. I just despise so much about them. Green Bay. Green Bay, my ass. You ever actually been there? The water looks like brown bay. Give me a break. The place looks like crap and it smells like shit. But, as much as I hate them, and I hate them so much, that out of all the NFL teams, if the Green Bay Packers came to me tomorrow and offered me a job as like a low-level scouting assistant or something, it would be the one team that I would hesitate to take that position. Like, I would even think about it with the Vikings and the Lions and not have nearly the same trepidation or feelings of ill will or internal personal conflict as if the Packers offered that type of position. It runs that deep. I hate that team. It's jealousy, it's spite. And I remember being from Illinois, how it was such a Bears-dominated landscape in the 80s and early, mid-90s. And then all of a sudden, here comes Reggie White. Here comes Brett Favre. The Packers are good again in the first time in freaking forever. And all of a sudden, all these Packer fans are crawling out of the damn woodwork. Bandwagon my ass. And that's exactly what it was. I don't care. Especially if you're watching this and you didn't live in Illinois, especially around the state line with Wisconsin at that time. You don't know what the hell I'm talking about, but it's true. Crawling out the woodwork. Bunch of wannabes. And these jerks. Oh, look at my team. They won four Super Bowls. We go from Bart Starr, skip a couple decades, here's Brett Favre. And then we go straight from Brett Favre to Aaron freaking Rodgers. Who's even better? It's unfair. However, as much as I hate them, I go out of my way to make sure I am fair in my presentation when I talk about the team. And I do feel like you can understand the bias that I have being a Bears fan. It's natural. But you'd be really hard-pressed to see where I've thrown out a lot of anti-Packers bias over the years in the way I've talked about the team, discussed the team, uh, and the like. I've been fair to them effusive in praise at times, sometimes defending what they do against Packer fans, mind you. So, I always feel it's important. You can have a bias and a hatred, but still call it as you see it and be fair. And I do try to be fair, and I defy you to tell me I'm not fair to the Packers. Which brings me to this draft. I hate what they did, because I know it made them a better team. All the years of Ted Thompson running the draft and the way he did things and the certain way he did things. You just got to that point in time with the Packers organization where it's like, how many more peak years of Aaron Rodgers' career are you going to waste? You have arguably the best quarterback in the game today and you have one Super Bowl to show for. Like the quarterback is supposed to be the be-all, end-all. And if you have the best one, you should be winning multiple championships. That's a disservice to Aaron Rodgers, that's a disservice to the other players, the coaches, and the organization, the fan base, the city, as a whole. It just shouldn't be like that. But lo and behold, this is where we are all these years later, and Rodgers still has the one ring, just like Brett Favre. And you get to a point in time where Ted Thompson's philosophy helped keep him in the mix for a certain period of time, but it wasn't getting them over the hump enough. So a change had to be made, and there were changes made in the front office. This offseason, Ted Thompson is no longer the general manager. You've got a new general manager in the wings. You have guys like Alonzo Highsmith and Elliot Wolf leave the organization. So change is afoot. So I really wanted to see what this Packers team did in this first draft with a new philosophy, new leadership, or if there would really be a change in philosophy. And I feel like there absolutely was. There was a lot of talk before the draft that the Packers might trade up, which is something outside of the realm of what they ever did really with Ted Thompson. If anything, they'd be likely to peel back as opposed to trading up. But was this team going to be aggressive? Were they going to do something different? Were they going to shake things up? And the simple answer is yes. They trade down from 14 to 27 so the Saints can take a raw defensive end and in the meantime get a first-round pick in 2019. As of right now, the Green Bay Packers are the only team with two first-round picks in the 2019 draft. That puts them in a position next year 
to do basically whatever they want in round number one, whether it's draft two guys or make a big move up to get one true difference-making impact player. All of that to trade back from 14 to 27 for a team not to take a quarterback. And then to flip right back around and go up from 27 to 18 and get their guy in Jair Alexander. A guy they very well have maybe had taken at pick 14 anyways. So you're telling me to move from 14 to 27 and then from 27 to 18 to take the guy that very likely we're going to take a 14 any damn ways. They may have lost a third round pick, but they picked up a first round pick next year and still got their guy. That seems like a tremendously massive win. I have to tip my hat off to that Packers front office and their general manager, however the hell you say his name, Gut Koontz, I don't give a crap. But you look at this, you set yourself up well for next year, and in the process got a guy they feel like can help you now. And then to double back in round two and get a guy like Joshua Jackson, the corner from Iowa, to fall to the board with size, with the best ball skills in this draft, when I looked at Joshua Jackson, to me, I'm, I'm a Joshua Jackson stan. I felt like he was the best corner in this draft. So I hate what the Packers did here because I felt like they massively upgraded their secondary, which has continued to be a weakness for so many years, specifically under Dom Capers, who was five to seven years past his relevancy in prime as a defensive coordinator. Now you're bringing somebody like Mike Pettin, who say what you want about him as a head coach, as a defensive coordinator. He's shown the chops as a defensive mind over the years to get a lot out of the units that he coaches. He's a quality defensive coordinator. Now you throw into the mix, you've already got Ha Ha Clinton Dix there. You've got Josh Jones, a second-round pick from last year's draft at the safety position. You've got last year's first pick in round two, Kevin King, the big athletic corner from Washington. Now you throw Joshua Jackson in and Jair Alexander in. It feels like they finally have effectively dressed the secondary position. That group as a whole looks a hell of a lot better than it has for a long, long time in Green Bay. And in the process of doing so, this team was able to pick up a first-round pick. Think about that. A first-round pick in 2019 is just crazy to me. It's outstanding work. They made a move up to go get Oren Burks. The inside linebacker from Vanderbilt, and I like his game quite a bit. I feel like he's a good fit, and I feel like he's an upgrade over what they have on the inside right now, and he should be, to me, a year one starter. So with their first three picks, they got three guys that should be starters and major contributors early on in their career, which is what you would like to see if you're a Packers fan trying to get the most out of the remaining peak years of Aaron Rodgers' career. And then as you transition to day three, they addressed wide receiver multiple times with Cobb not being as young as he once was. Jordy Nelson haven't been sent packing. Devontae Adams got his money. He's the number one guy. But where is that next wave? Where is that young depth coming from? Well, this is a team historically that has done well drafting wide receivers on day two and day three. So I feel like between the combination of Jamon Moore, Valdez Scantling, and Equinemius St. Brown, one of these three guys is bound to make it, and two of them might make it. But one of them is going to make it. And you look at Valdez Scantling. This is a guy who showed out incredibly well athletically at the Combine. Running the sub 440, 4440 at his size was exquisite. St. Brown dropped because of some potential character concerns. But you're talking about a guy six foot five at the wide receiver position that runs sub 45. You can fucks with that. You could do something with that. Jamon Moore has some athletic upside. And frankly, out of the three, I thought he was the least appealing of the three wide receivers that they took. But somebody out of that group is destined and bound to pan out based off of this organization's history, which makes this draft even better. Cole Madison, I look at, they took in round five. He might be a future right tackle for them or an interior lineman. Thought it was a good value there. They got their punter in J.K. Scott. You know, you could talk about drafting kickers and punters, but ultimately kickers and punters can have some of the longest careers in the league. You look way back at Mason Crosby when he was drafted what, out of Colorado in round five. He's been kicking with the team all these years. He's won one of the best picks the Packers have had over the past decade plus. J.K. Scott could be that same thing. This was really a solid draft and a good initial offering for their new general manager when you look at the philosophy, the approach, the things that were done, the positions that were addressed, no raging massive reaches to me, some pretty good values and flat-out steals, I felt like the Green Bay Packers were one of the top winners of this year's draft and set themselves up very nicely for 2019. So it was a win-win all the way around.